Now, um, what we are going to refer to as a fission is a kind of an activated emission or stimulated emission. So it, this is a very rough analogy, but you can kind of think of this as um, uh, incandescent light, kind of emission that happens when something gets hot. And um, what we call stimulated emission is like a, the laser light. So that's uh, uh, what happens with the fission. So this is something that just uh, happens in nature. You don't need any special arrangement of devices. It just happens in nature. Stimulated thing, you have to build a device that does that. So to make a fission happen, you have to um, have a device that uh, kind of, that you need to design a device to make that happen. And um, this is the sort of, um, so your textbook has a whole section on it. Let me just uh, highlight some um, portions of it that I want you to be aware of before we look at a simulation that's kind of fun thing to play with. Um, so most uh, naturally occurring isotopes, if you simply leave it out there, they're going to decay by alpha or beta decay. By the way, why am I not listing gamma decay here? Like why no gamma rays? What's a, what makes one thing, um, what's a one distinct characteristic of gamma ray that's different from alpha or beta ray? Massless. Massless, and also no charge. It's a photon. So gamma ray emission usually happens when an excited state of nucleus goes uh, down to a lower or ground state of nucleus. So you are changing the state of nucleus, but you are not changing the composition of nucleus. That's why I'm not listing it there. There's no real ga gamma decay, um, and it's not one that we can kind of do it by identifying what kind of isotopes you are dealing with. Um, so um, fission is, uh, so you, these are kind of simple reactions, right? You start out with one, it splits you into multiple things. Fission reactions, you don't start out with one. You start out with a sulfur, you, you start out with a two. So this is an example of fission reaction. Um, you, we can just uh, look at one, uh, let me, we can just look at one of them. Because um, kind of what happens on the right hand side, it kind of, there's many different possibilities. So what I really want you to pay attention to is the left hand side, your starting element. So. When you have an atom simply sitting by, or when you have an isotope sitting by itself, it wouldn't um, undergo fission on its own. Like if it's something that's gonna do that, it would have been something so unstable that it wouldn't be there in the first place. Um, so in a fission reaction, it's a stimulated process. You have something else that's impacting that nucleus, neutron impacting that nucleus, that's causing a kind of unstable state to occur first, and then it splits off. Here's a kind of schematic diagram of like how it happens. Um, this is the schematic picture of it. I mean, you know, I, it's a simplified picture, so I don't want you to take it too seriously, but you have an, a fissile atomic nucleus, and not everything undergoes fission because sometimes you can have like uranium-238. If it's struck by a neutron, it'll um, become uranium-239 and it'll quickly undergo beta decay into plutonium-239. It doesn't undergo fission like uranium-235 does. Uranium-235 does. So when a neutron hits it, it becomes this unstable state of uranium-236. And this is not a, a long-lived state. It quickly um, splits into, so this is the fission reaction. This is the fission, or I think fission means it's like splitting things, right? So it's, this process splits the nucleus into two parts, um, not always evenly sized, sometimes one's bigger than the other. In this fission process, it releases some amount of energy. And here's an actually important part it usually releases some neutrons. And usually, so this is the property of the material that we call fissile, meaning fissionable. 
So a fissile material would undergo such a reaction that on average, it releases more neutron than it took to uh, cause that fission reaction to happen. So uranium-235 is one of those fissile material, um, which is why. How many, oh, North Korea has been in the news. Uh, what's one of the first steps you go through, the step that Iran was going through, that when you're first trying to develop the atomic bomb? You have to enrich uranium, right? What does enriching uranium mean? Isolate uranium-235. So in the natural and occurring quantities, it's uh, mostly uranium-238 and maybe like 0.1% uranium-235. And they are isotopes, meaning they undergo the same chemical reaction. So they are difficult to separate out. And people develop the different processes. You can look it up later, um, just to carefully. <laughs> um, so the goal of someone trying to design atomic bomb is, or make atomic bomb is you have to separate out enough of uranium-235 so that you have a pure sample of uranium-235, not as much of uranium-238. And um, when you, the fuel that you're putting in reactors, that's only a few percent uranium-235. Medical research reactors sometimes go as high as 20, 30, 40 percent uranium-235. Weapons grade, I think it needs to be 90% and up, 95, 99%. So that's kind of the what you monitor to see, is this country building atomic bomb? So Iran is, I think, at like 40%. So they are not at the level to build an atomic bomb. <laughs> but when, you build a, when they build the facilities that can enrich uranium up to 95, 99%, that's when you see, oh, you are trying to build a bomb there. There's no other reason to have that. So, so this is the key components of a fission process that you need to have an initial neutron that's going to start the sequence of events. And the thing is this one reaction, it doesn't release that much energy. So what you need is a chain reaction. You need to start out with one neutron and you need this to kind of go start more reactions like it. Um, and that's where this reaction producing more neutrons than it used, it becomes an important part. So there's a simulation to kind of demonstrate this and why it's, a, so to get a chain reaction of kind of this type, why it's important to have a pure sample of uranium-235. And um, it's a fat simulation. Let me just uh, demonstrate in a conceptual, at a conceptual level. Um, because that's really a hole that this simulation is. Um, so it's a you know, it's kind of schematic version of um, fission reaction. And you can do it with one single uranium-235. You shoot a neutron at it. It oh, okay, undergoes fission. There it is. Um, so that's a single reaction that kind of, all right, so that schematic explanation of what's going on when you see fission. But other than that, um, oh, and it's producing three neutrons, and it's the version they are showing. So it's the chain reaction one that's kind of interesting. So when, so what you have in nature is, is kind of like this. It's where you have, let's actually have it even more than nature. Let me have it be 50% uranium-238 and 50% uranium-235. Actually, maybe, um, let me see if I can show you the prop, yeah, uranium-238. So if I have, oh wait, I need to have a target. Okay, there's, I think, at least one in the path, right? So this is what uranium-238 does. It, um, so it becomes uranium-239, and uh, uranium-239 do, doesn't undergo fission. It, it is still unstable. It has a re relatively short half-life, and it'll decay into plutonium-239, which is, once again, fissile. <laughs> but uh, because of the time scales involved in that, it, this doesn't undergo fission. So what uranium-238 represents 
in, um, in any reaction is watch what happens. I start out with one neutron. How many neutrons do I have? Zero. Zero. So wherever you have uranium-238, it absorbs a neutron. Like it uses up your neutron and it doesn't give any neutrons back. So that's uh, what you will see happening when you, um, when I have um, some uranium-230, about 50-50, some uranium-235 and uranium-238 kind of um, embedded in it. So it, the reaction will kind of start and um, the uranium-238 kind of acts as a shield for this uranium-235 because these absorb the neutrons, so there were these uranium-235 that never got to be hit by a neutron and no complete chain reaction. And this is why when you are building a bomb, there um, you need to have a pure sample of uranium-235. And the second idea that I can demonstrate with this simulation is the idea of critical mass. So like when you have one uranium-235, that's kind of simple, what would happen? It splits and that's it. Now, what do you think would happen if I have, I don't know, 10 uranium-235 um, nu nucleus and I fire one neutron into it? Well, let's try it and see. Let's try it and see. All right, some of them went off, but not all of them, right? You can kind of see why, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't have, so each time uh, my neutron hits on uranium-235, it uh, neutrons kind of go in random directions. So there's some chance of hitting another uranium-235, but if they are too far spread out, then it can escape, not do anything. So when you have a critical mass of uranium-235, this is what happens instead. Let me put a, I don't know how many is critical in this simulation. Let's try 50. When you have 50 uranium-235 and I fire one into it, then this is the kind of kaboom that happens in <laughs> atomic bomb. So almost all of it reacts um, because, so once again, when you have dense enough uh, collection of uranium-235, then the first two neutron hits it, the neutrons are going in some random direction, and it has a decent chance of hitting some other uranium-235 before it um, escapes entirely. And because with each reaction, you are getting even more neutrons, the more of these there are, like once it's all flooded with the neutrons, it almost, well, no, okay, not everyone, good fraction of them, like 44 of them will be hit by this uh, neutron somewhere in this cycle. So that's the basic principle in building atomic bomb. This is not anything that's a secret, that's public information. The basic design of an atomic bomb is you have two subcritical masses of uranium-235. The pieces that are too small to start in, result in chain reaction. And you bring those two subcritical pieces uh, into each other as quickly as possible so that as some, like uh, in a blink of an eye or less than that, in a nanosecond or so, you have a critical mass and then this now blows into pieces because then it's this setup. Um, so there's, I guess uh, some bomb designs have a neutron source in it, but even if you didn't have a neutron source, some component of radioactive will, will involve some stray neutron. So it'll kind of result in something like this once those subcritical pieces are brought together. So that's the idea, but even though now, let me just add some isotopes of uranium-238, kind of what you would have in nature, um, close to, eh, right, something like that. Um, about 30% uranium-235, 60-some percent uranium-238. Watch what happens, how the presence of uranium-238 kind of changes things, right? So the chain reaction that was able to happen before, like, so, you know, once again, the chain reaction. Uh, all right. Um, that, so I haven't taken away any uranium-235, but by simply adding these, you prevent that 
uh, chain reaction from happening. It's because those three neutrons that are going out, it gets absorbed by this uh, non-fissile material. So that's the basic idea in fission reaction. It's uh, now, you know, the actual, there's more complicated calculations there, like mean free path and how much, better, what's the actual critical mass. So that was a big part of the Manhattan Project where that's the part that scientists would work on. The scientists like Feynman, they would work on that calculation part of, well, how big a piece of uranium-235 do you need? for it to be a critical mass and it's going to go kaboom. And you can't try too many of those because it's not something you just simply build in a lab. The moment you build it, it goes kaboom and you die. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that if you read some of Feynman's writing, um, you will um, read him relating to how he saw the technical workers. You know, During World War II, they had a strategic division of labor. So the workers working at the the enrichment uh, facility, they didn't know what it was they were working with. So they were storing um, fissile materials together in a way that they could have become critical mass the way they are stored. So, um, and I guess it's a kind of, when you read it, it's a sort of um, a cautionary tale on why even people who are not theoretical physicists know the basic theories of the material you're working with so that you know when things get dangerous. Um, so, in fact, I guess uh, with the radioactivity and nuclear physics, it's a kind of, it's a history. Um, is riddled with when people didn't know how dangerous the material was that they were working with. Uh, Mary Curie, um, people think she died of chronic radiation, or I don't know what the correct term is. It's a long-term radiation poisoning because the early workers didn't realize how, just how dangerous radioactivity was, so they were overexposing themselves when they really should have taken precaution. 